to our next interview. Um, I have Joe Ray Perkins with me, who is running in the Republican primary for uh, Peter DeFazio's uh, congressional seat. So welcome so. to Community Television. Thank you, Joe. It's great to see you again after two years. It's yeah. been too long. It's been, it's a repeat performance. We, uh, we interviewed here, you here uh, two years ago yes. for the same race. Yes. So I guess uh, since Congress is every two years. So welcome back. Thank you. Um, so for the viewers who didn't see the last one, let's start with uh, who are you? Where, where'd you come from? Education, you know, sort of life history a little oh, bit. Okay. So I live in Albany. Married my high school sweetheart. We just celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary. Okay. And let's see, we've got two kids, 14 grandkids. So a nice, big, happy family. Okay. Okay. Um, my husband is a carpet installation contractor, and I am a full-time congressional candidate. I see. When, yeah, so, uh, and I grew up, I grew up in, a, in a state south of here, so I grew up in Southern California, and and uh, George and I moved up here um, 1975. Southern California. So are you of the San Diego divide, uh, variety or the Los Angeles I'm of variety? the Orange County. Orange County. I'm of the Disneyland variety. Anaheim. Anaheim. Yeah, I grew up uh, in Anaheim, Cyprus. So. I see. Yeah. Yeah, I've been down to Disneyland a, f a few times. So yeah, I, lived in the, I lived in Irvine for five years. Yeah, it's, gr it's a great area. Yeah. Love it down there. Mm -hmm. A lot of people these days. There is. It's changed. It has, cha it has changed a lot. I lived there during the 1980s, and uh, uh, when I moved there, Irvine was still pretty nice, but then they put 300,000 homes south of me, and, and things changed. Just changed there. the demographics a lot, just, the whole flavor. Just, just a just little the bit. Just flavor. Yeah. Just a little yeah. bit. So, uh, but yeah. Um, and my background uh, is yeah. financial planning, mm -hmm. so I've been a certified financial planner. I worked in bank brokerage. I've been in real estate, micro mm -hmm. business owner. Okay. Worked in uh, had years and years in the uh, working in businesses and mm -hmm. offices, and I'm just your everyday Main Street American. Okay. And any particular reason that you decided to uh, to do this? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Yep. It is something, Joe, that I am 100% sure of is what I'm called to do. Mm -hmm. So I have I have this uh, brochure that has a whole bunch of issues here. So I suppose we may. We might want to just start and go through them. We can do that. Yeah. So, you uh, first one is a balanced budget amendment. Yes. So, um, we are so far out of balance, you think we're ever going to get back? We can get back. And it's not a Democrat okay. Party issue. It's not a Republican issue. Mm -hmm. It's both parties and any independents that are there. Oh, yeah. it's, it's their problem. And um, so I'm not, I'm not going to cast aspersions on one party or another because that, at the end of the day, that doesn't accomplish anything by saying you did it. Yeah. I didn't, you know, kind of thing. You know, we, we watched our kids doing that. No, I didn't do it. I, so we can do that. And the balanced budget amendment that I want to see mm -hmm. is without new taxes. We have so many expenditures that do not belong in the federal government budget at all. Such as? Such as... Uh, Doing research on, and, and I don't think this one's in there, but it's, I like to say it, so I use it, but it's similar to the things that are in there. Um, the mating habits of a tsetse fly. Who cares? Mm -hmm. yeah. If somebody really wants to know that, then let private industry or some benefactor do that. That should not be the, that's not the role of the federal government. It's mm -hmm. not in the Constitution. And that's where my heart lies. I'm a constitutionalist. Okay. And the role of the federal government and of Congress is written in the Constitution and the Tenth Amendment says these things not specifically enumerated are left to the states so we can balance the budget. Now, I went back to school a few years ago to get my undergrad mm -hmm. and one of the classes I took was um, political budgeting. Okay. So we were tasked with taking a prior administration budget and balance it. So I took George W. Bush's 2005 budget. Okay. And I went through it and I eliminated across the board except for military 10%. Right. Okay. Didn't and I it, and I didn't touch Social Security, didn't touch Medicare. Medicare that, that was that that was left. But as far as line items, those types of things, I left the military there. Mm. There was one line that said other. Right. Hmm. Well, if you're other if you are not going to fit underneath any of these 
named categories, you're out of here. So I deleted other. Oh. I did find out later it was the CIA. I deleted other. So <laughs> right. I'm not a big fan of the CIA these days. 10% cut back. There was money left over, mm -hmm. which then I went, nice. We can take this money and use it to start paying down the federal debt. It is so doable, and 10% cut back is not going to kill any department at all. There's so much waste and so much overhead. There's so much duplication. There's agencies that are doing duplicating um, research and reports and analysis. Come on, let's, let's knock it off. Yeah. Let's get back to doing the job for the people as was envisioned according to the Constitution. Okay, so I guess that, anything else you want to add to that one? That about sums it up. Okay, and we have uh, federal lands. Yes. So that's number, next. So two years ago we had uh, the standoff. Yep. And I uh, followed that, mm -hmm. researched, talked to people that were there, talked to former, uh, talked to, because I worked at Oregon State University when all that was happening, mm -hmm. and uh, in the Department of Animal and Rangeland Sciences. How convenient for me to be in that department. So I talked with some of our faculty that, that live over mm -hmm. in, in the, uh, the Burns area and to a uh, uh, retired and emeritus and Lem over there, and that's where he raised his family. So I was able to gain mm -hmm. a lot of insight so I, I got a lot of background on different issues, and I, and I understood, mm -hmm. and, and you're kind of probably going, what's this got to do with the federal lands? It'll show up here in a yeah, moment. a huge amount to do. Yeah. But yeah. Um, so it, um, it gave me a really good, rounded idea of everything that was going on, and I understood what the Bundys were doing. Mm -hmm. I, I, again, I did my research, and, and I'm one of these people, I will look at, this, at one issue from multiple angles, I don't just go, oh, well, this is what they said, and that's gospel. No, I want to know, what did you see? You know, it's kind of like when right. there's an accident. Mm -hmm. They take all the witnesses. So that's really what I do. So looking at the federal lands, and this was something that, that had been brought to my attention before the Bundy thing, but the, Bundy, the, the Bundys um, really uh, highlighted even more to a degree what was going on. The federal government in Oregon owns or maintains... Um, Oh, shoot, the number just went out of my brain. I'm going to say 53%, and I think it's actually more than that now. Um, Nevada, it's like 90%. Mm -hmm. And people can go online to American Lands Council and right. see the map. It is, it's, a, it's crazy. But the, the Constitution is clear. Again, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17. It says that the land that the federal government is to have is 10 square miles, which is Washington, D.C., right. and other land that they purchase from the respective states with the consent of the legislature mm -hmm. for specific purposes for ports and forts, arsenals, and other needful buildings. That's mm -hmm. it. Nowhere does it say, and by the way, you get to manage all this land. By the way, you get to claim ownership of all this land. And what we have seen is, is the federal government coming in with these bloated agencies saying you can't be on this land, we own it. No, you don't own it, the people own it. In fact, specifically, if it's within the boundaries of the state of Oregon, right. the people in the state of Oregon own it. So let's get it back to the people in the state of Oregon. And maybe we might want to even look at selling some of that land to people that know how to properly manage it. And there's so much research that is out there well, the, def the definition of properly managed depends a lot on point of view. It does depend on point of view. Yeah. Uh, however, there's so much history and, and information out there that shows that, pr that land that is privately owned and managed, mm -hmm. these forest fires that we've had, how many of those have you noticed have burnt to crisp that are privately managed? You don't because they've got the resources and they get on them right away because that is their livelihood. That's money that's literally burning up. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then we've got the federal force. In fact, there's a, there's a firm out of um, Arizona called Veritas Consulting, and, right. and they did some great research on this. And, and people can go online and, and check it out, and they can see the differences because there's, there's um, this one area that, um, that they, they were showing us, and they said 50 feet away, federal land, privately owned. Yep. Burnt to a crisp. Yeah. Like, 
done well, you can, versus, you can. versus nice and green. The idea is we want to make sure that it's managed properly yeah. so that you and I and all of our friends can go out there and enjoy it and Bambi's not going to become venison. Well, the, Cajun venison. <laughs> you, know, you know, again, for every, for every um, case where you, you show two pieces like that, there's similar things. I mean, I remember years and years ago um, when I was traveling up and down the coast, I, I stopped at this uh, in Napomo, and uh, they had a section that was private of the, of the beach that was privately managed by the people who were doing um, dune buggies and the mm -hmm, like. Mm -hmm. Okay, there wasn't a, a piece of um, vegetation on the land at all. There was a fence on one side, mm -hmm. it's completely just sand on the other side. It's all this beach grass and, you know, holding the dunes. And what they were doing, was, and, and the sand would blow across the highway and they'd have to remove it off mm -hmm. the highway from all that. So that's, you know, that's an example 180 degrees in terms of managing the land that um, it was basically decimated and uh, was blowing across the highway, creating a, a cost associated with cleaning the stuff off of uh, US-1, so, or California-1, rather. Right, right. And um, so I guess, you know, you get it in, you get it in both directions. You, you get it in both directions. And in fact, I was just, just reading about this the other day yeah. uh, over there on, in the dunes. And where they're, they're looking at, there are some grasses that are um, encroaching. Oh, yeah, and invasive they're not, grasses. Invasive yeah. grasses, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and so now they're, they're trying to figure out how to mitigate those invasive grasses yeah. and still keep the dunes. And, and so what's happened over the years is we've brought together stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've needed to do. Instead of saying, oh, you're this and you're that. No, let's sit down and be adults and okay. let's get together and let's find, the, find, find what works so that, so that we've got these resources. On the forest, those are, that, that is a, a renewable resource. Mm -hmm. When the trees get to a certain size, they no longer absorb the pollutants to the same degree, and they don't put out the same oxygen level because they're full. They, they can only absorb so much. They actually do a lot better of cleaning the air when they're smaller. It's a crop. Mm -hmm. and the Douglas firs actually grow rather rapidly. So we can properly manage this, cut down on these forest fires that are costing you and I as taxpayers billions of dollars. Yeah, that was, that was a, a rather, putting out forest fires was a rather bad mistake because if you had a lot of small little scattered things, you clear out the fuel load underneath in the, in the brush and the main forest uh, remains. But when you, stop that for a long time, then the fuel load becomes really high. What do you mean when you stop that? Um, well, the Forest Service, you know, Smokey the Bear, only you can permit forest right, fires. Right. They were stopping forest fires. Right, which needs to be done. Yeah, which needs, it's part of the life cycle of the forest, yeah. Right, so the forest fires need to be stopped, not let them grow, because when they grow the forest fires, the amount of pollutants that they put out, there's a well, coal burning plant in Boardman, Oregon. One small forest fire puts out more pollutants than the coal burning plant does in Boardman, Oregon okay. in an entire the, the year. Point, the point that I'm making, if you compare, say, um, burns in northern Mexico with burns in the San Diego area, in other words, the fires are put out mm -hmm. and so, um, in, this, in the United States, and so um, the fuel tends to accumulate, and then you have very serious, very large fires. Right, because, whereas, we're, because we can't go in there and clean it out and properly right. manage it. Yes, whereas, yes. whereas in northern Mexico, they're just allowed to burn, and so what you get is these little patch burns. In other words, they'll burn to the point where they reach where the last little burn was, right. and it limits, it limits the size of these fires. So yes, the, the putting this stuff out, uh, putting the forest fires out for 100 years, um, which was a practice on both public and private land, um, was something that was not backed by good science and caused sort of an endless problem or, or a much larger I, problem. I'm going to disagree with yeah. you on that mm -hmm. because the forests need to be properly managed. Mm -hmm. What you've got for vegetation in New Mexico is different than what you've got for vegetation in, in Oregon, down here in, but, in but the Oregon. Same, but the same principle in terms of doing say controlled burns. I mean right now the Forest Service goes in and they burn out a small area 
and then every, the next year they'll burn out an adjacent area, and the next year they'll burn but out see, another see, we, see, we area. don't need to do that because burning puts pollutants into the air. Yeah, it we does. don't. We don't need to do that. We need to be properly thinning the forest, mm -hmm. getting the fuel out that way, and by thinning the forest and getting the um, the overgrowth of the underbrush out, that mm -hmm. actually increases wildlife in those forests and it actually helps the trees grow bigger and stronger because now they've got more yeah. more room to grow well, and the light is getting to them so and you and I are going to can, can, can disagree on this well, all the, day long and we've got other issues yeah, that I want to get to. we do that we can move to. So but I, I, I would like to you know differentiate between uh, managed um, clearing burns. versus clear cuts because the industry itself pre certainly prefers clear cuts. Okay just, so but that, okay you're talking stuff that happened that stopped happening over 30 years ago yeah. For every tree that is now logged, that is now cut, mm -hmm. has to be planted by five seedlings. But here's the challenge. Yeah. There are so many, the, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the Douglas fir is so prolific. Mm -hmm. We now have people that we pay to go out there and pull up the seedlings because there's too many of them. Yeah. So, and, and I don't know what they did back 30 years ago yeah. as far as that goes. But see, here's the thing that I think people were missing. If I'm a farmer... Right. And I'm planting corn, mm -hmm. and I harvest my corn. I'm going to till the soil, and I'm going to plant corn for the next harvest, right? right? Why is it that people think that that the timber companies were not doing the same thing? That's their livelihood. They were not going in there and just wiping it out and clear-cutting it and leaving it go fallow. They were mm -hmm. going back in on the regular schedule. They were replanting mm -hmm. because that's their livelihood. That would be as crazy as the farmer going, okay, I've got that crop of corn. Now we're not mm -hmm. going to do anything. So, I, and again, yeah. I haven't gone back and looked at, at the his, history yeah. of, of that. I will actually be, be meeting with somebody later today mm -hmm. and, and, and getting some more information on, on what actually, what did they do 30 years ago yeah. before, we, before we paid attention. Because, see, you can't see from the road even today. You cannot see those little seedlings. All we see is, oh, my gosh, they're still clear cutting. No, they're not. There's five times the trees in that piece of ground now than there were before they, before they well, logged it. Well, in, term, in terms of clear cutting, I mean, one of the things I'm going to do when, we fin when I finish all these, you know, 30-something interviews uh -huh. is um, repeat my trip down the coast. I bicycled down the coast from Canada to Mexico hmm. um, five years ago. And I'm going to go the stretch from here down to Los Angeles, actually to Orange County. Um, where I will stop and visit some friends. But um, when I did the trip uh, five years ago, I went through the Olympic Peninsula. Mm -hmm. And what I could characterize it as, because uh, there's not much traffic through the Olympic Peninsula, there's basically one main road that goes, okay. and, and it's pretty deserted. So it was sort of nice not having a lot of cars around, but right. at the same time, uh, what I was looking at was going from one stand of clear cut to the next stand of clear cut to the next one. And so there was this one that had happened 10 years ago and the trees were... Were growing. Were, yeah. were whatever, but it had all been clear cut. And then there was one that was five years ago and one that was 20 years ago. But they were all in sort of different um, stages of recovery, but it was all clear cut. It wasn't managed thinning. Okay, that was but going on. okay, but see, there's nothing wrong with clear cutting, and that's yeah. and that's the point. Clear cutting is not bad. You see, that's as crazy as telling the farmer you have to thin out your cornfield. You cannot harvest the whole cornfield at one time. Right. And people are looking at the forest in the wrong way. It is a renewable resource. Okay. And it is vital. And let me tell you what has happened because of. The spotted owl, which, by the way, is not native to Oregon, it was a, it, 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 uh, it's, yeah. it, it migrated here. Um, the 4th Congressional District, out of the five districts in Oregon, mm -hmm. has the highest poverty rate, 20% mm -hmm. out of the five congressional right. districts in Oregon. Mm -hmm. We have the highest rate of poverty. We have communities that are still, after the 80s, totally financially devastated. Families were devastated. Mm -hmm. Families broke up because this was their livelihood out there logging. And it wasn't only the, the loggers. You have all the mills that shut down. Yep. Thousands upon thousands of people lost their jobs. And it wasn't only the people that worked at the mills. It's now the truck drivers. 
they lost their jobs. It wasn't only the truck drivers, no. it was the gasoline stations. And it wasn't only the gasoline stations, it was the new car dealership in Coquille, Oregon that shut down years ago because there wasn't enough income. Yep. In fact, if you go to Coquille, you don't even hardly see a, a new clothing store. It's all used stuff now because they are so impoverished. Mm -hmm. That's what happens when people go so far to the other side. And they go, you cannot cut this because I'm sorry, I want to see that tree. I don't like seeing a bear, a bear stand where there used to be trees. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, well, I'm sorry, but it's a crop. And if you don't like that, then go talk to all the farmers also. And then you better not be a vegan. Yeah. Okay, because if you're going to be a vegan, then, you've got to, then you have a conflict. Because the trees are a crop. They're not just a forest. Somebody mm -hmm. has bought into, into the, the myth that the forest is supposed to be there forever and ever and ever, and it's a myth. And I will stand firm on that okay. all, day, all, all day long because I'm tired of seeing people being so impoverished and they have to rely on the federal government for their food, for housing, for medical. And these are people that were strong, well, hardworking people, and they were devastated emotionally, financially, completely devastated well, only because we're worried about a bird that actually the barred owl is a bigger threat and the bird isn't even native to Oregon because mm -hmm. some of you said that bird was more important mm -hmm. than the livelihood of people and I'm sorry people are more important than a bird any day of the week okay so and and yeah I mean and people can challenge me on that all day long but the point is it is not the job of the federal government to own that land. That's not their job. They're violating the Constitution. Okay. But going back to the, the question of poverty, um, what we have essentially done in our society um, is we have brought a lot more people into the workforce without actually producing an equivalent uh, economic good. You, no, you're, you're, you're going off on a, on a whole different tangent. Okay. Sure. I'm talking about the people that grew up in the timber industry. Yep. That has been a generational business for years yeah okay it's it's not it's it's totally different than than um people that grew up in the cities you know being mm -hmm. being from southern california yeah but let's let's you know, say, we, let's we, say we, don't, we, don't, we don't have you know we didn't have timber fallers okay. in southern california we well, had people that worked in the orange groves let's They're say not there anymore <laughs> let's say that there is a piece of land that's being cut mm -hmm. at this point um are they using the same number of people to cut that land as they did back when I was a child, back in the They're 50s. They're not because we aren't logging what we used to log. Well, we used to log in the Sayusla National Forest 400 million board feet a year. Right. And when I looked at a report the, that was just in the and, newspaper and, and two and days same, ago. And the same industry is heavily automated and mechanized. Okay, it doesn't at this matter. Point. It doesn't yeah, matter. Okay. You have devastated thousands of families mm -hmm. that have never recovered. From the I'm, loss I'm not of, that, arguing that. of that of that loss I'm not of that income. That. What I'm and saying what I'm saying is that a lot of those timber jobs would have been lost not due to the change in the industry. Okay, but see, you're, you're but you're totally discounting the people okay. that lost their jobs. No, that I'm not discounting them at all. But 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 Joe, you yeah. are because because even though there there's been automation, mm -hmm. it's still manpower to go out there and cut the trees. You okay. still had that manpower. You still needed to have the same number of, of log trucks mm -hmm. to take those trees down off the mountain. Okay. So you still had that. You would still have that. The automation was at the mill end where that became more automated. Mm -hmm. But if we were able to, and it's going to take years. This is, so people need to understand that when, as, as we, and there's science out there that, that backs okay. up what, I, what I'm talking about. But as we slowly, because we've lost all that infrastructure of the mills, Yep. And mills aren't going to open up tomorrow, mm -hmm. so it's it's multi-year, and we're at that tipping point because, again, as I said, a lot of the timber fallers, it was generational, and, and we've lost some of that, a large percentage. Mm -hmm. So it's going to take a long time, so people are probably freaking out, going, oh my gosh, she just wants to, wants to rape and pillage the side of the mountains. No, that's not what I'm saying, because again, different forestry managements, mm -hmm. yes, we still see clear cutting, because this is private land, it can be clear cut. It's replanted. They can go take in a drive through the Willamette National Forest and see the Doozer Corridor, and there's signs all over the place. There's signs mm -hmm. out here in, in the south part of the state that says replanted, and, you, and I mean, the Olympic Peninsula. 
you can tell, oh, 20 years ago. 20 years is like that. It's not long. The federal government does not have the legal right to own the land, to okay. own the range land. Okay. So let's move on to foreign policy in your, your brochure. So... I guess we've made a little bit of progress. We made a little bit it. of progress. There's, there's a long list, people. There's uh, move the uh, the embassy. Embassy to is moving to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and I'm very excited about yeah. that. I am very happy that President Trump. You know, he's not the first president said that that we recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, and that the embassy should be moved from Tehran to Jerusalem. But he's the first president who says, and it's going to happen, and it is happening right yeah. now, mm -hmm. and I think that is the right thing. We should not be going into countries and trying to topple their governments. That is not our job. A lot of these countries, we don't understand their, their thousands of years of, of, of yeah. methodology yeah. of their governments. Let the people decide what they want. And, and there's, a, yeah. there's enough people from the Middle East, again, working at Oregon State University was such a benefit to me. And I talked to a lot of students from the Middle mm -hmm. East. Um, so they're, they're here, and they're taking the skills that they learned. They're taking them back to their homelands. Yeah. And that's where the changes need to come about is organically through the people, mm -hmm. not through us telling a government that um, we're going to um, come in and topple them. I think, I think um, that's wrong. I'm in, I'm in agreement with that. Um, what do you think about what's going on in Syria right now? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not going to go down that road. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with what President Trump did, yeah. but um, the, uh, the results are not in yet. So I'm not, I'm not even going to go down that so, road. So you're I, not, no comment. The, the question is, was it a false flag, and, and what was the net result of the, of the, the, the problem? But yeah, okay, so foreign because, policy. Because, see, I can't, I can't say because we don't have the, we don't have the, the data back yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so gun rights. Gun rights. Second, Second Amendment. Second Amendment shall not be infringed. If you read the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist papers, most yeah. people read the Federalist papers only. Mm -hmm. But it was the Anti-Federalist who got the Bill of Rights through. And in right. and, and, and political science classes, we never even discussed the Anti-Federalist papers, which I thought was rather interesting, considering <laughs> they're the ones that got us the Bill of Rights, not the Federalist right. side. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went and I, and I read uh, just a couple of weeks ago what the Anti-Federalist said about the rights of owning guns. Yeah. And it's real interesting what they said. These guns were for... Hunting. What a shock. Yeah. Well, okay, we, so, so, so for hunting and for military use because that was the military. If they needed to call somebody to defend, then they, they were all expected to have their own firearms. And this whole thing about guns and we need to take away the guns from people. In fact, I just read this. I, just, mm -hmm. I, I, I read about two sentences. So I haven't read the whole article, but Dick's Sporting Goods is now destroying all of the guns that they had in inventory. But let's talk about what happens when you take the guns away from people. There's a little country called Germany, and there's a group of people called the Jewish people that were annihilated because the guns were mm -hmm. taken away. Not from everybody, but from a certain group of people. Mm -hmm. But here's my question, Joe. What are people afraid of with the guns? Well, there's... There's a number of issues there. I mean, first of all, I think the NRA is correct. No, 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 Let me finish what I'm saying. Okay. They talked about mass shootings, mm -hmm. that no NRA member has ever been involved in a mass shooting. Okay. I think, as far as I can tell, that's a, it, that statement goes unchallenged. Um, I see no evidence to indicate okay. that it's not true. So, in other words, what you have is, is citizens who own guns, um, legally are not involved in, in these problems. So why, why punish those people by taking away their guns? So you're going to find I'm in agreement with you. Okay, good. You know, Yay, we agree. Well, we actually agree. We, we on, agree on a lot of stuff. We actually agree on a fair amount yeah. of this stuff. But, um, you know, the school shooting thing, you know, we've got all these so-called student protests that are going on, which are really not student protests. So that's a severe misrepresentation. Um, but if you look at school shootings, two thirds, fully two thirds of them are suicides. One person involved walks into the middle of the hall, says, I'm tired of being on Prozac, Ritalin, you know, some other 
uh, serotonin, mm -hmm. you know, re reuptake inhibitor, yep, okay, yep. that has significant impact on, on a person's personality. And they're put on it during their adolescent years when their brain is going through massive Absolutely. forming, messes with their head. And, and a lot of that is simply to force boys to be more like girls, which I think is a problem. I, of, I agree. Of and by itself. So we can find some common Good. ground yay, here. Yay, yay. And so what you've got is um, two-thirds of those are people who say, no, nope, uh, kids who are, you know, have been <laughs> drugged, are being sort of bullied. Um, I think that there's, uh, the more I look at it, there's a great book out um, by Christina Hoff Summers called Who Stole Feminism that she wrote 25 years ago. And, and it was followed up by a second book called uh, The War on Boys. Hmm. And uh, both of which are, are definitely worth reading. They hold up um, really well after 25 years. Good. But it's a discussion of the feminization of education. And I think that um, there's been a lot of that. Um, I, I really cringe every time I come across one of these groups of parents who's objecting to the fact that their six-year-old is being, their six-year-old boy is being told that they have toxic masculinity and they have to check their privilege and do the rest of that stuff. So I think that what's happened is most of those suicides are like somebody saying, I've had enough of this, and just blows their brains out. But that's, that's the issue. In other words, this particular problem is being created it, uh, in the society. It is, and so we agree. It's not the gun's fault. It's not the gun's fault. It's not the gun's fault. It's, it's, and, we need to, and so people are wanting to take away the guns. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not the gun's fault. It's, yeah. I, and it's, I ask people, well, what if that was stabbings? Yeah. When, when you go home and you open up your kitchen drawer, are you going to freak out because there's a, steak, there's a butcher knife in there? Are you worried that that butcher knife is going to jump into your hand and start stabbing? Well, uh, what a crazy idea. Actually, the interesting thing is if you look at London, the London homicide rate is now higher than New York for the first time. In yep. And it's stabbing. Just about forever. And it's entirely knife-based. Yep. Yep. And because there's very few guns there. Yeah. And uh, Sadiq Khan, who is the mayor of London, has now implemented knife control. I know. It's, it's like, so, excuse me. And, that, and, that, and, that's, and that's the problem is that, is that we have a group of people that are instilling fear and perpetuating that fear. Yeah. Um, and fear has a great acronym, false evidence appearing real. Mm -hmm. We all want our kids to be safe. There's no question there. Right. So we need to then figure out what the problem is and and it's and it has been a mass societal change of people are confused they you know oh because i because i don't play with trucks i'm you know they're being told that oh well, you're probably really a girl inside because you don't like to play with trucks or a little girl doesn't want to play with her barbie dolls well you're probably really a little boy inside and and that's perfectly okay yeah. well wait a minute who said because the boys don't want to play with trucks and they like the dolls better that that they're not any more masculine than the little girl who'd rather play with the Tonka trucks. Yeah. That, that, that is just, to me, is just so crazy. Let people be people and stop trying to change their genetic, natural makeup. And if they're ADD, let's start looking at diet-based. Yeah, why, where and, is ADD coming from? Yeah, I it's mean, chemicals in our food, come on. Yeah. It, it, well, it, this has been going on for years. There, I forget the author. I read a book uh, not too, uh, a couple of years ago called The Tell. And um, he's talking about how people, you know, for example, when you're lying, there's usually some kind of a... Right. Of a, of a Involuntary. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Revelation, you know, it's, it's painted on your face mm -hmm. somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the arguments was that uh, their child had looked like they were on their way to autism, that you can, that there are clear tells as early as six months, and you can completely avoid it by changing the nature of way, the way you raise a child. In hmm. other words, um, more stimulation in the sense of engaging with the child more. So in other words, what we have is a society where a lot of kids are being put into daycare mm -hmm. very early on. Well, a child who isn't interacting with other, anyone, right. that's a bonus. So what we have is this system now where children are being put, put into, into this, this stuff. The workers there are overjoyed that they don't have to give attention to this child. But what happens is that's where the autism 
starts mm, to se set in completely. So what you do is if you have a child that, that's beginning to um, uh, show signs of isolation, that's the last thing you want to do. And yet it becomes the first thing that we want to do based on the nature of the society that we are evolving into. And so I think that there's a lot of stuff around that that needs to be looked at. I mean, I, I look at the educational system and it's just, it's, excuse me, um, we've got some real problems there. We, we do, and one of the, one of the big challenges is uh, boys naturally are, do not sit as still as girls do. And um, who are they putting on these psychotropics? Mostly boys. They, it, it's hard for them to sit still all day long in a classroom listening to somebody drone on about a subject that they're going, <sighs> it's frustrating. So then let's give these kids some, some bouncy chairs and the teachers need to learn how to deal with it. But having them stuck in these classrooms for hours on end, yep. they, 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 they need to have that, that outlet and, and, and get that energy out that's perfectly normal and natural. Well, and so there's, there's some major changes that people need to be willing to make. And so, so we're in agreement that it's not <laughs> that, uh, yeah. So let's, let's go to the next, let's go to the okay, next, the next so fun topic. Immigration. Immigration. What do you think about it? What do I think, huh? Um, I'm probably going to be wind, wind up uh, agreeing with you uh, in a lot of this. I, I think that we have allowed far too much immigration. We have... Um, allowed employers to break the law by hiring these people, which incentivizes mm -hmm. them to come. Uh, I'm fine with immigration, but let's, let's vet them. Let's follow the laws associated with that. Um, and uh, so illegal immigration, I think, is a serious problem. And that, of course, puts me at odds with people on the left. Yep. And they are very happy to scream at me and tell me what a racist and a horrible human being I am. But I, I do think that we've, we've essentially done three things to the working class. Um, and I don't begrudge women if they want to work to work. But at the same time, we've forced a lot of women into the workforce, mm -hmm. which essentially if you take your supply and demand, we've moved the supply, which produces a reduction in... Um, in average pay uh, for people working because we've increased the supply of workers without a corresponding economic value uh, produced. The second thing we've done is exactly the same thing with immigration. And then the third thing we've done is we've shipped a lot of the jobs overseas. We used to manufacture things. We don't do that anymore. And that's policy at the federal level that needs to be changed. Which, and, and it is being changed, which is wonderful to see the jobs coming back and the businesses saying, we're coming back. You know, both Bernie and uh, Trump talked about that stuff. And I, I, you know, that was one of the things with, with Hillary that I just, it's like, nope, can't vote for Hillary. Yeah. You know, when, when you hear a candidate say, I'm going to shut down an entire industry. Um, yeah. That, that, that to me is just, is just scary. And that, and then this whole manufacturing thing goes, it even ties in with, some of the timber stuff that I was talking about, yeah. those jobs that are lost and, and us thinking everybody needs to go to college and get a college degree. Why? Yeah. I actually made a ton of money without a, without a four-year mm -hmm. degree. But, but just consider this studio. I mean, I'm, I'm pleased that, that community television has a studio, but this used to be the wood shop. Wow. And we are not, I mean, you can actually see the little holes on the floor where the machines were bolted down that have been patched now. But the... Um, those, those industrial arts, working with your hands, is, are, is no longer being taught. It, it, um, is, it is in some, in some areas. In Albany, the Albany School District, mm -hmm. we, they have a wood shop at, at West Albany High School. They've got auto shop at South Albany High School, Lebanon. Mm -hmm. High, so some of the schools, and so for, for down here in the Eugene metro area, they need the, the parents need to push and say, hey, you know, it needs to come back. It, it needs to come back again. This is another, it's staring at a computer and doing um, non-active work is not, it's not healthy for us to start off with, to be sitting around all day long doing nothing. That's one of the worst things we can do. Yeah. And, um, and I say that from somebody who's been sitting around too much lately because that's what happens when you're campaigning. Um, although today we get to go out and knock on doors. Uh, so we, so we, we, we need to do that, and so yeah, that immigration, we need to change it. And you mentioned London. My husband and I just had our 40th wedding anniversary, mm -hmm. as I mentioned. So we decided to go to London for four days, mm -hmm. four nights in London. Really, that's a very fast trip. 
um, and we talked to, we, we ended up taking the cabs everywhere. Yeah. The weather, it was cold. We went to Squaw Valley when we got married, and yeah. so it was snowing in London, so I was laughing. I, it was just inappropriate for some reason. So there was not a lot of walking, um, but we, we got, a, I love taking the cabs because we got a chance to talk to the cab drivers, yeah. most mm -hmm. of them from London. We only had one that was, was not a local person. Um, and they shared with us how they don't like the open borders through the EU oh, and yeah. why they had voted for Brexit and how it had changed the flavor mm -hmm. of their yeah. homeland. And they, none of them were anti-immigrant. That was never the question. It was, it was, it has changed it so much. But one of the cab drivers made a comment that if we look back at the U.S. history, we would see the same things. If you go to the East Coast, the Italians mm -hmm. are all congregated together. The Jewish are all congregated together. We still have Chinatown up in Portland and in yep. San Francisco and in New York, right? Mm -hmm. So we still have those enclaves. Yeah. And so he said, you know, they're, they're trying to tell us to integrate, but yet the Greeks are still hanging out with the Greeks and the and the, the folks from the Middle East, the Iranians, the Iraqis, etc., they're still hanging out with people from their homeland. Yeah. So really all they've done is move from this homeland and just kind of brought it with them. Right. And they're not, they're not becoming part of, of the culture. And they, they, they didn't like how that, how, you know, that, that, that changed. And of course, they've gone through some pretty rough stuff over there, but well, um, this is, it's interesting. It's sort of built into the Quran, the Quran that, you're, that you're supposed to take over the world. And anybody who doesn't conform to you is... Uh, an infidel? <laughs> Haram, an infidel, whatever you want to call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, okay, so we're still talking about, okay, so you've got build a wall, e-verify, and chain migration. Mm -hmm. So talk about chain migration for a so, second. So chain migration has gotten out of control so when people immigrate here mm -hmm. legally, um, having their, their spouses, their children, that, yep. yeah, that makes sense. And then, and then their parents, okay, and then their siblings, okay. And then it started stretching out. Yeah, to cousins to, to and cousins friends. To cousins and, and, and my fifth cousin five times removed, yeah. who I, I've, I've never met him before, yeah. but, but he's still in my, in my family lineage. And to where we're just, we're just opening it up. But it's caused another problem that I have not really heard a whole lot of people talk about. Mm -hmm. It's caused a vacuum when we pull the, the best of the best mm -hmm. because of going, we, we do, we want productive right. people here, right? But then it leaves, an, and, I, and I know I'm saying this phrase wrong, an intelligence vacuum in their homeland if, if there's yes. too many. And mm -hmm. that causes a problem to where that country or those countries um, cannot begin to prosper because if they're all coming here. And so I think that we really need to take a hard look at that. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things, again, working at OSU, uh, there was a position for um, an associate professor in uh, the rangeland sciences. And um, they ended up hiring somebody from Turkey Mm -hmm. Wonderful man. I, we, we had phenomenal conversations. He lived in Syria and Iran mm -hmm. and, and Turkey. So it was so, uh, Sirkin and I had just great conversations. I, I loved it. And, um, but yet there are other qualified people here yeah. in the United States, U.S. citizens. But because the mantra, oh, we have to be diversified or we have to do this, it's okay. So we're doing this to the detriment of our, well, of our, of our citizens uh, which to me is wrong, and so that, that's part yeah. of that immigration problem. Well, it, it's, it's turned out under the social justice mantra that um, it's anti-white, it's anti-male. Yeah. And so what they're really doing is they're saying, we're going to end racism by being racist. We're going to end sexism yeah. by being sexist. Yep, yep. We're going to end violence by being violent. We're going to end hate by being hateful. It's like, excuse me, there's a problem here. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't doesn't always quite no. work, and and whereas I mean I'm I, I'm sort of a lifelong lefty, um, in the sense that I believe in the Enlightenment values, what's called the classic liberal values, mm -hmm. you know, equality under the law, um, equality of opportunity as opposed to equality of outcome, um, freedom of speech, freedom of association, 
um, those kinds of things. And there's, Joe, a, there's you, a long Joe, list Joe, of them. Joe, you sound more like a conservative. Well, then, 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 because I, and I know you're saying classical liberalism, yeah. because when we look at that, but well, that has changed. The, the reality is that over the past decade, there's been a reversal. Mm -hmm. Okay, when you when you think about conservative values, um, there are a lot of people who were trying to impose particular points of view. Uh, for me, a lot of it was around the religion. I mean, I'm fine. You want to you want to do your religion, do your religion. Mm -hmm. But don't impose your religion on me. Mm -hmm. Don't impose your religion on the school system. Don't, um, yeah, evolution's a good example of, you know, don't go in and take the science out of the science books. Um, that or, kind of or show both views. Or what? Show both views. Show the creation view and the and the evolution view because they actually complement each other but that's another well, that's another that's another we, topic we, we could have we could have a, a pretty serious argument about that because I, I i don't think they complement each other <laughs> okay but uh okay your last item here on immigration is in sanctuary cities and states okay and oregon is a sanctuary state oregon voted to become a sanctuary state in 1987. Yeah. so um just this past year in oregon might have been earlier this year. There was a gentleman uh, who was arrested yeah. in custody. The FBI, the excuse me, ICE called, and I want to say it was Multnomah County Sheriff, mm -hmm. and said, "We will be there in 15 minutes." And the sheriff let him go. Yeah. The man went into a 65-year-old woman's home. He beat her to a pulp. He raped her. He stole her car. Mm -hmm. Then. The police see him. They go on a chase. He ends up in a parking garage. He goes to hijack a car. Mm -hmm. He beats the woman. The woman tries to get out of the car, and she couldn't get out because where she was parked, it was up against the, the, brick, yeah. the, the, the parking structure. He beat her to a pulp, hit her head into the, into the concrete wall, yeah. almost killed her. Now he's spending 35 years in a state prison which is going to cost us millions of dollars instead of being turned over to the federal government. And this guy already had an extremely long rap sheet. Yeah, it's, it's basically Willie Horton for, you know, all over again. And yeah, and so, so. We, we have laws, we have rules. The number one job mm -hmm. of the federal government is to protect our country from those who want to do us harm. Yep. And um, again, so, you know, I'm sorry, but if, if I had done what that man had done, and the um, FBI or the federal government called up the law enforcement and said, hey, this person is now wanted on this warrant. As an American citizen, believe me, they would have held me. Yeah. They would have held you. Absolutely. And that's what's wrong with sanctuary cities and sanctuary states. And people that want to get that change, there's mm -hmm. actually a petition out there called IP22. Find it, sign it. It's going to end sanctuary state in Oregon. The the thing, the thing that we're going up against is 50 years of essentially social justice university training, uh, which is a mix of postmodernism, um, economic and social Marxism, man-hating militant feminism, and intersectionality. And oh, the that's an interesting term. The number of people who have bought into that whole thing, because it really, the whole postmodernism thing has a huge reality denial aspect of it. In other words, anything that I feel is true is true. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's really... It's my reality? That, yes, <laughs> that was the split between um, the Enlightenment and the Counter-Enlightenment. It really hinges on Kant, who was looking to re-justify the existence of God hmm. by denying the value of reason and denying the value of our senses. And um, because God was kind of getting beaten up in the philosophic world uh, in, in the sort of enlightenment thinking. And so, of course, if you're, if you're reestablishing, well, if I feel that God exists, then God exists. And the church just loved that. And because they controlled most of the educational system at the time, um, that's what got taught. And right. it really, yes. it really mm -hmm. broke between the English school of philosophy and the German school of philosophy. And the German school of philosophy is what brought us World War I and World War II. And the current authoritarian perspective that's, for example, uh, forcing the uh, mass immigration in Europe. 
the open borders thing. But that's all that. So let's move on to national debt. Which ties right back up to the balanced budget amendment and the yep. federal lands mm -hmm. and all these yep. other costs that were going on. So um, my brochure sees exceeds $20 trillion, which is true, but it is now over $21 trillion. Yep. And so uh, we need to cut that, and which I stay in there, the, the, the duplicative, the duplicated research that is going on and cut out the mm -hmm. agencies that we don't need. Um, yeah. We've got, uh, and I know this will freak people out, but that's life in the city. Uh, mm -hmm. We have the EPA. Yeah. Oregon has a DEQ. They do the same job. Why yeah. do we have both? We don't need the EPA in Oregon if we have the well. DEQ. So, so there's some things that, that, that they might, they might cover over, but one of the things that has happened since I saw you two years ago, there's a farmer up in Millersburg. His name is Bill Case. Yeah. And San Yam River borders his farmland. Mm -hmm. And it started encroaching into, into his farmland, 800 feet long, and was eroding deeper and deeper. And so he went to, up to the state of Oregon. He met with the Corps of Engineers mm -hmm. and said, okay, what do I need to do and what do I need for permits? He said, you don't need permits. This is what you need to do. Mm -hmm. You're not violating any laws. So he did exactly what he was told to do. Mm -hmm. He kept the erosion, you know, stopped the erosion, which of course was putting uh, all kinds of dirt into, into the river. And the EPA comes along and they started fining this man $30,000 a day. Yep. And when I saw him, the last time I saw him, he goes, I don't even know how much that's cost or, you know, the bill is that they're saying I owe right now. And I said, Bill, I did the math yesterday. I said, it's $90 million. You have that in your bank account, don't you? Yeah. You know, I was hoping he wasn't going to have a heart attack on the spot because he knew it was a big number. He just hadn't done it. That was such an overreach of the role of the EPA. Mm -hmm. Sandy River isn't even an inter in interstate high, uh, free, uh, river. It's an intrastate river. Yeah. So they have zero jurisdiction there. And the DEQ and the Corps of Engineers in Oregon, they were the ones that told Mr. Case that he was doing exactly the right way. Mm -hmm. It was fine. No, it wasn't too warm for the fish. No, it, he wasn't adding ter no. turbidity into the river. He was stopping the turbidity. Mm -hmm. And um, that's just, that, that is just one example that will work for the national debt. Okay. Uh, so you've got national defense. Mm -hmm. And then you're, you indicate that you're pro-life. Yes, I'm 100% okay. pro-life. Term limits. Term limits. I, uh, I believe in term limits. It's, uh, the founders were very clear. They never in, intended for this to be a career at all. Right. And they said, go serve your country for a time, and then if you still want to be active, go back to your communities yeah. and be locally active. Mm -hmm. So I will sponsor or co-sponsor a bill for a constitutional amendment that will allow a person to serve a maximum of 12 years in Congress. Mm -hmm. Now, most people think of Congress as being the House of Representatives. Congress is both, right? So six terms in the House and two in the Senate. Oh, that's 24 years. Two in the Senate, 12. Correct. So you could do, correct, correct. Yeah. So, that, so that's the 12 years. So you, so you could do, but underneath my proposal, what it will be is a 12-year maximum combined. Oh, okay. So you cannot be in D.C., as a member of Congress, the House or the Senate, for, maximum, for, for more than 12 years. So mm -hmm. if a representative uh, retires midterm um, and somebody is appointed until there's special election, that number of months for that appointee counts against that 12 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they could not self serve 12 years in three months. It's 12 years. So they could serve one term in the Senate. They could serve three terms in the House. 12 years. It's plenty of time to get the job done. And when I hear people say, oh, well, it takes two terms in the Senate before you know what you're doing, I'm sorry, but any corporation in America, you go to work there and you tell them, you know what, it's going to take me at least six years to get the feel of how this job works. They're going to go, goodbye. Yeah. You're, you're not, you're not going to last. Mm -hmm. So, um, in fact, I got laid off at OSU. They, they did some restructuring, eliminated my position. And because uh, it was a union position, I have and still have the right to bump somebody after yeah. almost a year. But they said, if you take another job, you have two weeks to prove efficiency. Mm -hmm. And if you cannot prove that you're efficient in that job, goodbye. And I'm going, that's totally legitimate to me. Okay. 
So I guess in, in, you know, to kind of go back to a little bit earlier thing, um, what's happened recently is that uh, conservatives are now the people who are promoting, say, freedom of speech and, and a number of other rights. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't the case 10 years ago, but it has, there's a reversal. Oh, I think it was the case 10 years ago. Might not have been the case back in the 60s. When, yeah, you, <laughs> well, you, had, you had, of course. When I was a young child. Yeah. Um, but you had, a lot, you had a lot of people who were, um, I, think, I think a lot of the, the limits on, on speech were coming from the right. I, I, I can't. I, I don't know. I'd have to go back and 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 do some do some research and, and reading reading on that. So yeah. so I, um, I think I, I, we may have been more balanced ten years ago than we are today. Yeah, I think there was it was less of an issue. Although the um, how do I put this? Um, yeah, it was it was well. So I, I think that what's happening is that because the left has sort of abandoned a lot of these, you know, classic liberal principles, it's it's now fallen to the right to support them, and so that's kind of an interesting change in in the politics in this country. But we have about three minutes left. Okay. So any things you want to add to this? Well, yes, I I do. So in the primary, there's five of us running. Yep. One of those candidates has already lost four times to Peter <laughs> DeFazio. Yeah, he's actually going to do an, he's actually signed up to do an interview. He um, refused yes. one two years he, ago. He did. He refused one because um, he saw me as, well, I won't put words in his mouth. Um, that wouldn't be kind of me. I'll ask him tonight. Mm -hmm. um, so two years ago, there, in fact, I got a phone call from one of the other candidates this week, mm -hmm. wanted to know, did you guys have any debates or anything he said no he didn't want to interact at all so uh so leave that leave, leave that as it may mm -hmm. um but he so art robinson has already proven that he does not know how to defeat peter defazio in fact at a state meeting for the oregon mm -hmm. republican party in june of 2016 art stood up there and he says we have not figured out the the formula on how to beat defazio but we're going to try yeah and in my world, there is no try. In the words of Yoda, there's only do. Yep. And, 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 and I've had that belief for, for, for years and years. So when I'm talking, it's when I win, that word if does not come into my vocabulary right. at all. And so um, I, I know that Art filed the day after Court Boyce went out and spoke with him. And Court and Art are friends. And Court is a Curry County Commissioner. Court was elected in November of 2016, mm -hmm. and now he's running. He could have run for Congress before for the for U.S. Rep, um, but because of the, the the Chetco Bar fire, 200,000 acres just under this last year, he's decided he needs to do something. And I've had this conversation with Court, so I'm not saying anything out of turn. Court and I talked about it, and I said, "Great, Court, why don't you work at the county level? Let me work at it from the federal level." Mm -hmm. Let's come together and make this happen. But he decided that he wanted to do that. He could have run for Congress at any point because yeah. there was the biscuit fire not too long ago. And then the other two candidates are, are younger, nothing against their age at all. Um, I, I've met Mr. Poland once. He's a real estate agent. He's in Grants Pass. He actually lives in the second congressional district. Um, Grants Pass was carved out many years ago. Mm -hmm. um, nothing against that. It's perfectly legal, legal to do. Uh, if he mm -hmm. ran in the second, he would be going up against uh, Representative Walden. Mm -hmm. So he may not want to do that. And then the other young man running ran no, for mayor. Stefan. Stefan yeah. Streck. And Stefan was registered as a Democrat, other, Democrat, other, and then Republican. Interesting so, character. I did, I did get to interview him. Yeah. But uh, we've pretty much run out of time. All right. So I want to thank you for the conversation. Thank you very much. And, and people can go to Perkins for Oregon. That's the number four, right. PerkinsforOregon.com. Um, all of my contact info is in there, the voter's guide, my personal cell phone number is in there, and the phone mm -hmm. has been ringing. People have a question, and uh, please, if you're on, on the Republican ticket, not if you're not a Republican right now, call me after I win the primary. But if you want to vote, here's, a, here's a, mm -hmm. a really important thing people need to know, is that if you have gone to the D DMV in the past year, or in the past two years, you need to double check your voter registration because it might have gotten changed after my daughter-in-law because she went in and after her and my son got married and they re-registered her as not affiliated so she couldn't even vote for me two years ago. OregonVotes.gov 
If you want to change your registration, you've got till 11.59.59 p.m. on the 24th of this month. And my name is Joe Ray Perkins. Please vote for me, and I will be your voice, Main Street American. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. I love the dialogue.